Politicians are also just people. They can also see a, a value in Bitcoin. Bring education about money into schools. Why do we think that an economy needs inflation to function? Protocols have this network effect that one will end up being the, the main one. Political decisions affect things locally and temporarily, while technological changes affect things globally and forever. How do you think Bitcoin will change the narrative around money, especially in the mainstream? Hmm. That's a very big question. Um, Bitcoin is so beautiful because it challenges everything that we have learned so far, basically. So it's here and um, it forces you to ask, I would say, um, simple questions that in reality are not at all simple. So not at all. I mean, I can make some examples. Mm, what is money? What is money actually? What was money? How does our current monetary system work? Who has major influence mm, over our monetary system? Mm, why do you, or why do we think that an economy needs inflation to function? Can inflation be even measured accurately or not? What are the advantages and disadvantages of elasticity of the money supply? I mean, I can go on and on, but I, with this, I want to make the point that um, Bitcoin is here. Bitcoin now gives you, if you want, a whole new perspective where you can look at the system that we have now, our monetary system, from a whole different viewpoint. And you can come to also different conclusions because when you have something that forces you to ask new questions, automatically you come to different conclusions or usually. Uh, one example that maybe can be made here is maybe it's very similar to the geocentric model that uh, was believed to be true um, back in the days where also, especially the church said that the earth or the earth is at the center of the universe and, um, and the planets are basically circling around. Um, that was the, the, the mainstream common knowledge. And then scientists and, um, Galileo also ca came and said, people, we might have some evidence that this worldview is completely wrong. And he came up with this what we call now a heliocentric model that not the earth is at the center, um, but we also are just a small planet circling and we are not so important as the church believed to be or us to be. Yeah. I don't know if this answered it, but you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, people have a hard, I mean, it connects even with, with Bitcoin because people have a hard time uh, humbling themselves, like get, stepping over their own ego. And this was one of my main problems when I came into Bitcoin, actually. I thought for three years that it was a scam. And but do you I, have a background in economy? No, I did not. And this was kind of, I think I, it was an advantage because I had um, a more clear mind and I went into Bitcoin uh, four years ago. So I was like 21 or something like that. So I did not have a lot of preset in my brain. Uh, but still for three years while I was investing in stocks, while I was watching all those stocks and ETFs investors uh, on, on YouTube, I had still this like inflationary mindset a little bit inside of my brain. Uh, and I thought an asset that does not make a cash flow is a scam. <laughs> like I also did not uh, know where, why gold has any value. So for me, it was a big step to get into Bitcoin because I thought it's a scam and it changed my view of money a lot. Like probably also with you, did, did, your, did Bitcoin change your view of, of Bitcoin more from like inflationary mindset to like an Austrian economics mindset? So um, maybe just briefly from my background, so they also the audience um, knows. So I my background is completely um, focused on molecular biology. So I did my, my bachelor actually in, in Austria, in, Ven in Vienna, focusing on uh, biomedicine and biotechnology. And then I moved to, to Switzerland um, and I did my master's in 
also molecular health sciences, the master is called. And now I'm, now, and now I'm in my fifth year um, of PhD focusing on um, skin research, so skin inflammation. And um, with this, I would like to say that um, my knowledge about our financial system, about money in general, was literally zero. Maybe I would even say minus one, because I, I never asked uh, questions like this. So I was forced to look into this. Why? Because I did not understand why I even have to invest to transfer my purchasing power into the future. So you have to imagine, um, the fo yeah, I, I can briefly describe the situation. So as a PhD, uh, also in Switzerland, um, you, are, you are actually below the actual minimum wage. Or in general, I would say if you are in academia, you don't do it for uh, monetary reasons, but you do it for, for the passion and um, love for, for science and, and your field. Um, but I, you end up being like around 30 and then you have your degree. But what do you do, right? So I always tried to be kind of, try to save, try to put money aside for my future, for potential family and for, for dreams that you have as an individual. Um, and then this was um, the time where there were also negative interest rates and you had to pay the bank and there were so re really like, to me, strange fees where I was like, how can this be? I mean, and, and people were talking around me all the time. Yeah, you have to um, let the, the money work for you, uh, invest it. Um, you have to basically broad, broadly diversify uh, to minimize risk. And um, this triggered me so much that I went down the rabbit hole of um, investing. So really, really deep, uh, trying to figure out um, what do I need to do? Um, how can I do it? Um, what is the possibility to do it also paying less fees and so on? And then the conclusion usually is um, index funds. Go with index funds, broaden, diversify, and so on. And then I uh, discovered uh, crypto. And also with crypto, I was again like, what is this, you know? What is all of all these Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, blah, 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 and stuff like that. And then I tried, um, as I usually do, to um, systematically work my way um, down the, the ladder. And I started with um, with Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, I never, never stopped with Bitcoin because uh, Bitcoin then, as I said previously, forced myself to answer answer questions that I did not previously ask and I understood things much much better I would even say yeah that's fascinating for me that you so you did not have any altcoin phase yes it's I, I had pr uh, very briefly uh, because the diversification um, message was so strong into my into my brain um, that it made sense to me uh, back in the days, not understanding that this is a, a protocol technology and usually protocols have this network effect that one will end up being the uh, the main one, especially when we talk about protocols or a ledger like money. <laughs> um, so yeah, I had it uh, very briefly, um, but yeah, I would say couple of months and and then I really focused on, on trying also to really understand uh, what it is yeah do you still have like this diversification uh, in mind so that's also a very good question because here it's also the question how convinced you are about one thing right so um the question is also how you set up yourself do you now sell all your ETFs and all the rest and you go all into Bitcoin um, this is every every person should, should of course decide uh, for themselves, um, but I didn't do that. So also kind of opportunistic maybe because uh, when you diversify the ETFs, you are uh, still um, supporting and uh, this not disagreeing with our uh, system that is currently um, how it's currently functioning. Um, but crypto, I completely ignored and focused on on bitcoin only yeah uh, it's, it's it's really cool uh because i had this diversification mindset not really 
uh, like I always understood, um, if you want to get somewhere, you have to focus on one thing or like a maximum two things. Uh, and if you want to maintain things, then you want to uh, diversify more because then you want to diversify your risks. But what if there's an asset where there is no real risk involved? Like when you have a stock, you're always like, okay, what if the CEO goes, like <laughs> he dies? Uh, what if the management team makes a bad decision? Or what if this product, the new launch fails? So that's why it makes sense if you have L old individual stocks that you hold more than one individual stocks and make like five, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe an ETF, something like that. Yeah. But for Bitcoin, but I, as, yeah. sorry if I interrupt, but I would just rather uh, point to this thing that for me, it's even more a question of morality even. Because if now it's one thing, if you think a company is very cool and you like the idea and you want to invest in this company, then go for it. I mean, this is this is how how markets should function. But it, it's another thing um, if you want to just keep your purchasing power over time and you broadly diversify blindly into an ETF. Because uh, what is happening there is that um, these ETFs, not only ETFs, um, also um, yeah, buildings, real estate, they get a, a monetary premium. And this monetary premium is there because um, money is actually losing a, um, a, correct, a very important characteristic, and that's the store of value um, ability of money. And when this is the case, and let's make an example, now if you then invest in, in, in broadly diversified ETFs, um, you're giving a huge market advantage of in, in those companies that are in these ETFs. Okay, so... Um, they can then use this increase also in, in their stock price and then again re replay um, our the system that we are currently in, get cheap 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 debt and uh, have this huge market advantage that um, others don't have. Or let's say real estate. Um, real estate is also when it gets a store of value functionality or that's like the main function that it has compared to the function of people needing a roof over the top uh, this is not so good also thinking of like resource allocation how much you need to build these homes uh, just to then store value and maybe let them even empty what does this do with our resources what how is this you know for our environment and so on so every time money loses the store value ability we have we have an issue because you're forcing people into towards things that are more scarce and you might also price out individuals that need that need this house i mean i can make one brief example um so my family um got a, a sum of, of of a bigger sum of, of fiat money because um, life insurance i think of, of my dad ran out or something like this and then there was this question yeah what what do we do what do we do with this money? Uh, this should not be a question. I mean, you should just be able to store uh, purchasing power over time. But then the decision was to buy a second garage, even though they just have one car and there is no need for the second garage. You, you, you get my point, right? So the garage was the better store of value compared to the money. And this leads to, uh, I would say resource like um, uh, a a misallocation of resources as well yeah, and it leads to an unhealthy society where everybody is uh, not focused on their main thing they try to on the side be a portfolio manager like that's exactly. basically what, what, like what, what cheap money is doing and this is what i realized actually before bitcoin because I was quite successful with stock picking and I loved it, and I will, I, and I will do it in the future again if Bitcoin becomes more boring. Because I just have a lot of fun in in researching companies and investing in them. Uh, maybe like doing uh, not public, maybe like private, something like that. Uh, but back to the point: family and friends got interested because they saw money go up technology in the stock market, uh, and they wanted to know what I'm doing. And I held this presentations for like five, 10 people and told them what I do. But all they wanted to do have is uh, 
system where they can just put their financial energy and get it uh, rising or like they, what they actually wanted is like the same purchasing power over time, <laughs> not not diminishing purchasing power over time. Uh, and this is what I did not understand that Bitcoin is a solution and not trying to educate everybody how to be a stock picker. <laughs> that's, that's like bullshit. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, that's that's fascinating for me. Uh, maybe like back to the micro uh, to the biology um, what you are studying. How did this like change or help you in in understanding Bitcoin? Some, sometimes like you have to when you study something completely different. I had had an astrophysicist on my channel, and his way of thinking of Bitcoin was really unique. How did this study or this process of learning something un help you understand Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting question because, I mean, in the end, what also molecular biology is, it's, um, it's a, a science that you, you learn how to ask questions and how to falsify hypotheses. So this is one thing that you always do. You ask, you, you have this biological question in mind, and then you plan your experiments accordingly to uh, falsify uh, your hypothesis. This is like the, the, the core, okay? And then if you, so in other, in other words, your, my studies gave me a, a kind of analytic toolbox that I have now here. Okay. You have, can imagine I have my analytical toolbox and this analytical toolbox, I can apply to other things. And, um, this is what I did when it comes to trying to understand, um, uh, what money is or trying to understand the question if an economy uh, needs inflation um, or, or what are the adva advantages and disadvantages of this elasticity of the money supply. Uh, I try to use my toolbox and answer this question. The thing is that in biology or in, in natural sciences, you usually have then a reality because you do an experiment and that's like physical things that are either you can kind of touch or like, you know, gravity you can describe and stuff like that. But in, in what I find very interesting in, in economy is that um, it's not a natural kind of science. Um, so even though we have these um, numbers and we have this Uh, formulas and every time you open a textbook of uh, macroeconomics you're like okay crazy there are so many formulas and, and numbers and stuff like that these models are basically based on uh, yeah based on very intelligent people that came up came up with these models trying to describe human interaction trying to describe um, how we are trading with each other And then I, I, from this, back to the molecular biology uh, perspective, um, I can tell you that trying to describe um, how cells interact with each other is so complex. It's so really like crazy complex that you always need to be kind of humbled by um, your experimental output or the data that you have okay so you are able to maybe look at this small tiny window of like cellular com communication through one protein being secreted interacting to a receptor and signaling good this is a finding but still it's always just you tr need to be hum kind of humble with this with this data that you have and what i have so this is just my personal thought here i think we um, in, in in economy sometimes Or in these studies, we we are forgetting this humbleness. We are forgetting um, to also try to question these fundamental principles of uh, do we actually need 2% inflation? Just one example. Doesn't GDP always need to grow? Or what does this even mean? Does it, what does GDP measure? Is it You know what I mean? So it's like those things that um, we hear in, 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 in the news or also in papers and publications and then we are like okay um two percent inflation that's god given somehow yeah and i think uh they, they might start to uh, get to three percent a target or four percent target <laughs> because the two percent inflation will yeah. be hard and harder to hit i think uh but that's another topic uh, you also really uh, you 
triggered earlier. You, you said it before with Bitcoin talents. Uh, what are what are you doing there, and, and do you do you do something else also in the Bitcoin community? Yeah, so that's also interesting. To how did this all start? Right, somehow I learned to never say no to things in 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 the Bitcoin space. But everything started with a um, presentation that I gave in front of my lab. You have to imagine we are around 30 people or so. And um, we usually have lunch together. And in my in my phase where I learned more and more about our monetary system, um, I was this weird one that um, came there and said, um, yo, people, today I have a very controversial statement or a very controversial topic that I would like to discuss. And then we had you know, 40, 50 minutes of, of this lunch break. And I always introduced um, these monetary aspects into this crowd of people that are extremely intelligent, uh, but also have zero background in, um, yeah, in, in how money works and in, in our financial system. And um, this basically led, so the conversation were extremely engaging. So just a couple of examples that, that we were discussing. One famous one, of course, um, uh, why we left the gold standard. This is the question of, um, or how, do, how did we even came to this um, global fiat monetary standard that we have now, right? So you always need to go back to the uh, previous stages. And this was very interesting to see the reaction of the people there, right? So uh, you, your audience will, will know this, but maybe for, for uh, some people um, coming in that did not hear this, uh, 1971, um, basically the US left the gold standard with this Nixon shock uh, because they, um, yeah, they, they, they did not keep this promise uh, that, they, uh, that they said during the Bretton Woods system, right? So they, they said basically that... Um, The dollar will be backed by gold, but then the Korea, Korea War, Vietnam War, huge infrastructure programs were done also on, on debt, over leveraging the system. And then in 1971, um, President Nixon said, temporarily, we will uh, break this peg. So this, uh, again, just explaining, them to this, uh, explaining this to them. And then um, they were like, okay, crazy. So this was a political decision, one person deciding for Uh, yeah, plus minus the whole globe, uh, how the monetary system will change. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yes. And they, you know that it was it's crazy if if you never um, heard this. But going back, so this led me then to make a two-hour presentation about all of this, all of this information, and um, it was really good because this presentation I, I kept in front of them because every time, you know, during lunch breaks, it's like 30, 40 minutes. You never have time to really go through all of it. So I said, please give me two hours. If you're interested, come. So in the institution, I, I booked a room and then people came, two hours presentation, very nice discussion. And the feedback was so good that they decided also to um, upload it on YouTube. This video then was noticed by two guys uh, near my hometown, which was also very interesting. So we started a very small Bitcoin podcast in South Tyrolean in this dialect <laughs> that now sadly is not, not continuing. But you know, this, it's always like you, you add some little bit pieces of knowledge there in this community and so on. And this then led me also to the participation of the um, Bitcoin Talents program that you previously mentioned. Sorry for taking so long. But this is very cool. So the, the Frankfurt School of Finance, um, they have different uh, programs. And one program is this Bitcoin Talents program that's Bitcoin only. Um, and I participated in the first cohort. Uh, and I thought, well, this is really cool. First, I was a little bit skeptical. Is it like about like kind of blockchain or whatever? But no, it's really about going through this rabbit hole um, with proper instructions with assignments that you can do individually and that you can then present every time. I did this and after that um, I also decided to be a mentor there. So now I am a mentor for the second and third cohort and this is very interesting because you get people from all around the globe. It's in English and I can highly suggest uh, if people are interested um, to, to look at this. It Now every year I think it takes place. And um, the cool thing is that you get a piece of paper, you get a certificate. And as we know, um, these pieces of paper, they 
in our world, uh, sadly or not so sadly, they kind of uh, legitimize what you're doing. So I decided to do this primarily also for my for my family, for my uh, surroundings that always um, thought that Bitcoin is basically a scam. And uh, now when you're saying, yeah, look, the, the Frankfurt School of Finance is also doing this and they have cor- like a course with uh, professors being behind um, Professor Philip Sandner that um, sadly recently passed away, launched all of this. Um, this gives credibility. You know, this gives cre- credibility uh, to, to Bitcoin and this is why um, I did it. And this then further uh, cascaded to me um, going to also conferences, meeting people. I was invited um, in a German-speaking um, podcast with uh, Nico Yilch. Um, so if, if you have someone that is also listening in from the German space, they, they might know him. And then you, right? So we also kind of uh, communicated over uh, LinkedIn and, and, and now I'm here. And another thing that I almost forgot is... Um, I'm also part, this is also kind of interesting, I'm also part of a, of, of a movement, I would call it a decentralized movement uh, called Bitcoiners for Future. And um, we take this uh, bottom-up Bitcoin approach and combine it with this an environmentalist idea of the Fridays for Future movement that is also very known in, in, in the German space. But the main difference is that um, we think the change needs to happen in every individual. So this bottom-up approach with a sound money system that it's actually good for our environment. We, we can go in into that as well versus the top-down approach um, with um, hoping for political uh, rules and laws that sometimes can even um, shoot back. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a Bitbox. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in the middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description there there are so many great uh, topics in there in, in, in the <laughs> short rant that you just gave it gave me um i think with the energy fat and education we we might just as well start um i feel like the only thing that holds bitcoin back uh to not be at a hundred percent full adoption rate is technology and education technology because we are simply not ready to be a reliable payment system we need layer two layer three technology like i think we still still need applications to be built uh, and layer technologies to be built like we are not in the end phase of we're seeing all the tech there uh which is okay because we are really early still Uh, and the second one is just education as you mentioned people just don't understand what money is and they don't understand what bitcoin is and they don't understand the technology of that and they need to understand all aspects of that to actually understand Bitcoin and adopt it, which makes it hard. Um, so like the question goes in the direction, how can we enhance the education part? Like how can we get monetary education, financial education 
uh, into our society. I mean, the mentor thing is a great thing. Uh, there is like podcasting is a great thing. Just speaking about it, being willing openly to discuss it uh, as you met did it with with your lunch group that's amazing that's what that's the decentralized education that we kind of need uh and uh then after that we can get into like um why the energy fight is actually uh useless but let's start with the the education side do you think like is there a chance that we also get the bitcoin and financial education in our schools uh is there any like how how would you approach it that we get more and more Uh, financial education and what is money questions in in our new generations that I, th very good question so i think first of all um everyone should try on the in this decentralized way right um everyone has uh, working bodies families don't be annoying don't be the weird bitcoin guy um but just try to uh, yeah point it out sometimes not always And so this, I think, is very, uh, very good. Second thing is, I think, um, what the Frankfurt School of Finance um, is doing with this bit with this Bitcoin Dalens program is super cool. I think more stuff like this is coming, or maybe it's already there, and I just don't know about it. Um, what um, El Salvador is also doing with, I think, it's called Primera Bitcoin or some of something like this. It's Right, me, something. Me, Premier uh, Bitcoin. I think my, my first Bitcoin is the the, uh, the translation. I think. Yeah. So this is also a very perfect example uh, where you have education um, being done uh, also in schools. That's 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 the key aspect. Now, bringing education about Bitcoin in schools, uh, that's very interesting because um, with another initiative that where I'm active, it's not about bringing Bitcoin into the uh, system, but it's bringing education about money in general into the system. So this initiative is called, it, in, in German, Die Welt von Morgen, so uh, the world of tomorrow. And uh, what we are trying there is to um, approach politicians in, in one or two years with um, clear impulses and clear indications what needs to be done. And one of these impulses is exactly this. Bring education about money into schools. This is missing uh, completely, okay? And there, and of course, the thing is, you know, it's also cool to not just learn about Bitcoin. I highly advocate also for people looking into other um, views about money. So, for example, don't be no, don't just be stuck in this commodity theory of money. Also, look at the credit theory of money. Lynn Alden, with her book Broken Money, did an amazing job. One one thing that, in my opinion, was missing, bringing this bridge together with these views of like the Austrian school. I would say focusing more on the commodity uh, on the commodity theory of money and more the chartalist view, focusing on the credit theory of money. The reality is that both theories have something in common. So both theories have something in common that money is a ledger, and both theories have also as some some truths behind it. Every time you have a lot of trust in society, the credit theory of money made a lot of sense because it was much more efficient to have the central authority deciding the ledger and stuff like that. But when trust crumbles, then people came to the commodity theory of money. So I just, with, with again, with this rant, I would like to say, um, also look into MMT. You know, you have to diversify your thoughts. Again, to this diversification, I think diversification of learning is super good to then decide if your argument still is holds holds value or still is like true. Still made the other, um, the other point. So again, back to the school system, Bring all of this in. Bring all of this in and let people individually try to yeah, make their own decision about what is really then a good uh, monetary system that is good for, for humans, but not just for humans, also for planetary boundaries um, and so on. And the third point that I want to make is, so first, um, decentralized individuals bringing out the knowledge and starting conversations. Second of all, hoping that this comes into, into schools uh, or trying at least. And the third one is rather the, the thing that is said, but 
that's just true. Uh, we learn through pain. Humans learn through pain. So um, if we will experience um, also in, in the privileged world that our monetary system is is really not functioning um, and is starting to have like very high inflation, um, th then people will learn. Because um, yes, I, I would say error correction is 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 this basis of of all intelligence. You know, we we developed with error correction. <laughs> biology develops with with error correction so that's that's how how things work but let's hope to not come to this point yeah i, I think pain is the the best learner always i mean we also see a little bit of the bitcoin adoption uh, where's the bitcoin adoption the the biggest i think nigeria with like 30 percent even greater than in el salvador where the president is behind it uh so there's like uh The, the more people need Bitcoin, the more they adopt Bitcoin logically. And that's why in the West, it still seems like as a luxury product. It still seems like, oh, okay, if you have a lot of money, then you can buy and diversify a little bit into cryptocurrencies, uh, which uh, enrages me a lot when, when people say like, ah, Bitcoin is just for rich people. No, actually not. <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin is more for, for not rich people uh, because they, have, uh, they need it even more. And what drives you actually personally to, to do so many, so many things in Bitcoin because it's like not your field of studies, it's not your professional field actually. Uh, what, what drives you to do so many things in Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah, as I said, actually, I'm, I'm also, I need to do my PhD, right? So hopefully it will finish uh, next year. <laughs> um, what drives me? Um, I think it's this inherent feeling of also a little bit knowing that our current system is not so really just, it's not so fair. And um, I think when I'm, I'm, I'm a person that when I see something that is not fair, I, I point to it and I don't stop. And every time I have the possibility of like pointing towards this, even though I know, you know, this is not so good now point towards this, I do it. Because I, I think it's really unfair uh, in a world where you have around, I don't know, 160 fiat currencies or, or so, uh, when you look at how many uh, are basically not useful at all outside of their local monopolies um, and how also um, we have, yeah, almost like a monetary colonialism with the US dollar being um, used to kind of keep the South in, in a constant state of development. And, and if you want to really say it in a strong, in a strong term, you can say even debt slaves, you know, having like debt slaves to sustain this, this wealth that we have in the, in the West. I mean, I'm, I'm a profiteer of the fiat system. I, I, I completely say this open and loud. Uh, because I was lucky where I was born. I was born in, in a place where the currency, I would say, still was still rather stable, you know. But uh, we have uh, around 8 billion of people and the majority lives in situations where you have unstable money or dictatorships uh, that can also uh, censor trans transactions and so on. So I would say there is this kind of inherent feeling of um, there is something that is unfair. Money is kind of the foundation of, um, yeah, almost every interaction, uh, almost every social interaction that's outside of family and friends. Uh, so let's focus on, on this foundation and see, okay, let's objectively see if there are flaws. I'm not saying that uh, I know 100% that are flaws. I ju I'm just inviting people to also look at them objectively in an open conversation and discussion and, and, uh, and yeah, and come to a conclusion. This is why I, I, I think I'm trying to also, yeah, I'm active in the space and I, maybe I will be more active in the future. Who, who knows? I will tell. <laughs> and it's, and it's amazing. You also said like you see something that's unfair. You see the the, the let's call it fiat system as unfair, 
a lot of people in the Bitcoin sphere, uh, me included, also say that inflation in general is theft, like the monetary expansion uh, also always is stealing something from someone and giving this to someone else. Is that what you mean with unfair? So uh, the thing is also about this inflation topic, right? So first of all, how do we define inflation, right? Now, is it just expansion of the money, money supply? Is it the CPI inflation? What is it? We cannot even like agree on, on this point. <laughs> it seems like we cannot agree on this point. Um, but it's clear that it's unfair um, in a sense of like you have people being, yeah, almost kept in a state of constant development to to allow the products that we currently have. So our inflation would be, would be much, 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 much higher if you don't have uh, production in whatever Vietnam or in countries where the wages are very low. Why is this? So just, you know, ask, your, ask me these questions. Why is this? Uh, w how would it look if we would have one common denominator? How would this situation look if there would be one global currency where also those people would be able to save um, in, in this currency, would be able to save in, in yeah, whatever. If, if it's Bitcoin, it's big Bitcoin. But you know what I mean? That's, yeah. um, that's the thing. Do you see a, a future where we come to this, like where, where we have one uh, global ruler, uh, ruler in a sense of measuring our denomination? Uh, and it might be Bitcoin, but like, the, do we come to this conclusion where like fiat currencies, all those different fiat currencies will, will die or merge into one global reserve currency or asset? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I can just speculate, right? So I think um, I, we, so I will not see it in my, in my generation. I mean, we will not see it in, in our generation, I would say. Um, but I hope. Uh, I hope because I think a system like this would be fairer. And I can also try to describe why I think a system like this uh, would be uh, would be fairer. So first of all, of course, then the question is of this denominator. Is this, is it like fixed or not fixed, right? That's also, that is, that is an important point. But let's just first, first focus on we have one common denominator um, and also bring the perspective of uh, Jeff Booth and many others uh, technologists that are um, big in the space, but not, not only in the Bitcoin space. So it is known that um, a competitive market without monopolies and with a constant, constant increase also in technological development leads to lower prices. I mean, this this is uh, Jeff Wolf is still waiting for someone to come. No, this is this is not true. This is false. I'm also waiting for someone to come and say no. This is not true. Um, I'm st I'm still waiting. Why? Because if as a consumer you have the chance to uh, look for different products. Okay, so we are in a competitive market, um, and you look for a product. Um, you always will choose the option that is um, cheaper and maybe also better for you. So better quality, also lower price. So this is something that we always do. Also, when we go in the in the grocery store, sometimes we 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 look at at the bottom shelves, right? Because those where there is where the prices are cheaper. So you look at the bottom shelves. Just one one and one analogy here. But if this is the case, um, then prices should be falling to the marginal cost of production. And now again, going back to this uh, global denominator. So prices would be falling to the marginal cost of production um, everywhere. So um, every, every person in this globe uh, would kind of profit uh, for uh, if the US or if China has some um, technological progress that now suddenly we are able to whatever harness ener energy much more efficiently and uh, put this uh, productivity um, into um, our our work. And now there comes the crucial point of like, okay, is the measuring stick fixed or can it be um, larger or can it be played around with? Right. This is then the the question of. I mean, if we would say now inflation, the inflationary money supply. Um, this we can also now start to argue or look into it. My opinion, it would be fair if this 
measuring stick stays the same. Why? Because the next question is, who decides? Who decides when the measuring stick is enlarged or even shrinked, right? So there, there, there are some questions that come up later that we always need to try to answer, but we can also learn from history. And when we look back in history and there was this the denominator, usually it ended up that it was, if it was, was easy to expand, um, humans try to do this. Why? Because it's super nice to get purchasing power without needing to, to work, right? Without, with some kind of tricks. And the tricks go back in history. You can say one trick was just more, more technological innovation, allowing us to dig out more salt or allowing us to make more beads. And this was, was is one trick. And the other trick with, with uh, coins or coinage is to dilute, dilute the commodity, so the gold or the silver that is inside it, these, um, these coins. And so you're expanding this. And uh, we always did this. So that's the crazy thing. Bitcoin brings digital scarcity. And this digital scarcity, we of course, we never had digital scarcity, but we never had something that is so scarce in a sense that the supply is, is fixed. H humanity never had this um, because also gold was the thing that is coming closer to Bitcoin. But... Um, who knows, right? Elon Musk with his endeavors in, in space. If we sooner or later will get some gold from space. And so the, the, the inelast inelasticity of Bitcoin again forces you to bring up new questions. And these new questions can be just discussed. So we never we never lived through a system like this. We, we have no idea, right? So one could also argue that elasticity in money sometimes can be... Um, first benevolent, so it can be done with a thing that it's needed to do, right? So you have this catastrophic event and and you are like this institution you had, you, or people came into this system of governance and then this central institution is saying, oh, people, we need now to expand this money supply to um, combat this. But the problem is when you don't ask the people anymore, when you're financing stuff, with not debt and you have so you're you're basically and um, putting away the the consensus of okay i pay more taxes to maybe finance this but you're paying it with with just expansion of the monetary supply and this is also a thing that happened repeatedly over over the history one example if, if i'm ranting now but i will just like bring one example how the um, bank of england um, bought up government bonds to uh, finance the first, um, to enter in the first world war. So, and the Financial Times saying that these government, uh, these war bonds were uh, basically bought up like, like crazy. So the population was behind this. And 100 years later, um, people went down into the archives of the uh, Bank of Ind England and, and, and saw that this, this, this is, was not true. This was not true. I think just even one third was bought up by the po population. The rest was literally just um, financed by the Bank of England, okay? And then the Financial Times made, made this apologies that they reported wrongly. But now, now I stop ranting, but you, you see the points, right? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, it's fascinating to think about it. And uh, all of, like, to a certain extent, it's all speculation. But to a certain extent, we can also really look at history and uh, how money developed and see how Bitcoin actually succeeds in, in those environments, which leads me to one question that came up to me uh, when I was listening to you, your rant in the middle. Um, who will actually benefit the most from Bitcoin? Like what, is there a group of people uh, or is there, is there some, uh, some, something that you think of when we get to, let's, let's just say we are getting into the next 150 years to a kind of a full Bitcoin standard. Bitcoin is like the unofficial global reserve asset. There are still fears around, but who will benefit from that? The most obvious question is like the, the early adopters, but 
Uh, more broadly, do you think there's like a group that benefits uh, the most from Bitcoin, uh, even besides the monetary aspect, maybe? Okay, very interesting. So into this process, if we assume that Bitcoin keeps on being this um, this monetary tool that people accept. So as you said, of course, uh, first of all, the early adopters. So the sooner you're in, uh, the higher the price uh, will go. This is this is clear, but uh, you, you are taking also on uh, more more risk. But now let's think more more broadly. Um, besides the monetary aspect, I think one thing that is still very underrated or also very misinterpreted by um, not just media but also a lot of people is this proof of work consensus algorithm and what this will do with um, electricity and with electrification and so on. Um, so I'm also very um, excited and, and bullish about this. Why? Because not only have we um, invented or have we now discovered, who knows, right, digital scarcity, and we also have now a new market participant and um, in this um, ele electricity market that we did not have before. And this is proof of work and basically Bitcoin mining. And I want to briefly describe this. So it's a, you can call it energy taker of last resort, something like this, I would, I would uh, call Bitcoin mining. Why? Because the incentives for the miners are always to look for the cheapest source of energy. Okay. This is something that um, is, is completely clear when you look at how the um, algorithm uh, works. And this incentive in combination of miners being a kind of local agnostic so they are very mobile and they are also like um, they don't have issues of being turned off and on okay so this combination and um, is new is completely new so um, also if you think of other um, servers or something like this and um, or ai that will come and um, you will not be happy if um is Suddenly you will have, yeah, wait 20 minutes because our servers are currently down because there is more demand in the uh, in the grid of wherever, right? So this will not happen for, for AI. But for Bitcoin mining and its global adoption, this is no issue. So you have miners can turn off and on quickly. Um, so this also needs to be taken into account. So again, going back, we have this new um, market participant. What will this lead to? We can already see uh, some very interesting developments with uh, Gridless. Um, Gridless um, has also this aim to electrify Africa, right? So uh, how can this be? I mean, you have Bitcoin miners that take electricity. How can then this lead to electrification of Africa? It can happen or it is already happening because you have... Um, uh, structure infrastructure or pro programs that now are profitable because you have Bitcoin coming in. So you can now build up infrastructure there because you have Bitcoin miners saying, okay, we can make this profitable for you. And in addition, you have small local regions that can profit from this. And then the interesting point is, okay, imagine now this uh, local regions get bigger uh, and they have then other industries and they demand this um, electricity. What happens? The miners, if there is more demand, suddenly the, the price of electricity is rising. So they, luckily they are local agnostic, so they can move again. So they will look again for other cheap electricity sources. One point. The next point is um, the combination with uh, renewable energies. So in Europe, I mean, you, you notice just the, when you look at the news. So one big aim is to now um, go basically completely renewable and uh, how the the, um, the um, Europ Europeans are defining renewables. It, I don't even think nu nuclear is defined as renewable. So it's solar and uh, wind. Or is nuclear now also defined as renewable? I don't know exactly, but I think it, it should be. But uh, I don't know if it is. <laughs> yeah. So even, let's say even if it should be, so the main... The, the whole consensus here in Europe is that nuclear is also bad. So not, let's not go into that, but let's go back to um, the renewable solar and wind. 
So those uh, energy sources have um, one issue. So they are very cheap, but they have one issue. And uh, the issue is that um, they are not good for base load. So they have peaks and, and troughs, right? So now Bitcoin comes in. Bitcoin comes in and it's like, yeah, no worries. Um, I can also make this profitable because I'm interested in stuff that uh, just basically cheap electricity. So if you have huge peaks, I'm I'm there. I, I will take it. So the, we have some synergies that are starting to develop that we don't even know of yet. And um, this this will come. This I think it's very, very interesting uh, besides the, the monetary part. Um, you even have companies that now are building Bitcoin heaters, right? So you can go away from the from the gas, um, generating heat with gas, but you can go to electricity uh, with your um, mining rig. So I think we will see so many new things that we cannot even think of yet. And I'm ultra bullish um, about that as well. And uh, very much looking forward that this, I think we will see. We will see this. It's it's something so completely new, and I think uh, we saw Texas was I think the the first one that actually tried it with with uh, working with the Bitcoin miners to uh, balance the grid if there's like peaks and stuff like that that you also touched on, uh, and it it will it will be so fundamentally different a world on Bitcoin, uh, just based on this assumptions, uh, and also like I had a great podcast with Lisa Huff on. Uh, where she's talking about the energy companies could be the next wave of Bitcoin adoption after the ETFs and all, everything because all the energy co companies sometimes even pay for someone else to take their uh, excess energy. And if they don't have to pay for that, but to get money because they all of the sudden can mine Bitcoin with that peak in excess energy, uh, that completely changes the game and will skyrocket the the mining hash rate even more, even though like if you look at the chart, it's like basically a straight line up. Uh, uh, if, if you look at the, the chart of, of uh, the Bitcoin mining hash rate, uh, which is yeah fascinating to see with where where we're going and where we can end up. Um, more broadly, uh, maybe back to, to uh, maybe going to, to politics where we did not uh, touch on today too much. Um, do you think that Bitcoin or sound money system in general, where the politician, political force do not have a say in where where are we going with the monetary uh, expansions and don't have an infinite money glitch with uh, money printing, uh, do, do you think this changes politics uh, in a massive way or will they just be more careful with money? Yeah, also a very good point. So... I think I, I would cite um, I would cite Lynn Alden uh, by saying that uh, political decisions affect things locally and and temporarily, while technology or technology technological changes affect things um, globally and uh, forever. And the thing is that um, politicians are also just people, you know, so. Um, they can also be, maybe they can also see a, a value in, in Bitcoin. And they can also see that um, um, our system might need some changes if we want to um, continue to, to live on, on, on this planet. And maybe the time has, has basically come where um, we need to also look closer at some fundamental things that we take for granted or basically we, we take just as, as given but but one thing that i also would like to say it's always very very dangerous to think uh, you are right in in matters where established individuals are wrong so that's also um one crucial point that one has to say because um i think um, bitcoin will not there will be some pushbacks. Uh, we recently see this also with uh, privacy and, and things like that. Um, but th this this is part of the game. You know, this is part of the game. And um, I hope that we can manage again to foster uh, objective conversations about this technology, putting away all this 
huge bag of kind of just things that people think, you know, just put away their opinions, come to a table and openly discuss this technology. Let's try to foster this. You are doing a great job with your, with your podcast. So the more we do this, and again, going back to education, right? The more we um, achieve open and objective education without getting um, closed in in our political beliefs and ideologies, that is just counterproductive. We live in, sadly, we live in a society that is getting more and more polarized. And more and more polarized with political beliefs and uh, people that are against uh, the system and so on. And I mean, you have to be honest here. Um, bit, I think um, you have more people getting closer to Bitcoin that they have some trust issues with the current system or they, they lost trust with the system. This is, this is a fact. But the question is, how do you approach people that uh, don't have trust issues at all because maybe they are very also privileged, right? Um, or they just uh, have had never had the, the chance to 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 think about this. Or as as we talked very early, they never had the chance to think that um, this um, geocentric model uh, might not be um, the the best model for for humanity. So I'm I'm a, a human optimist <laughs> in a sense that I um hope that we can come together um, in on one table and discuss things um, openly, objectively, and not just throwing around opinions that don't bring us anywhere. And this is such a great and beautiful point because this is kind of the point also of my podcast, uh, just bringing as many different perspectives on Bitcoin. And I even had uh, people on that did not wear completely in Bitcoin. They had some other investments also. I usually steer away from everyone that anyone that has anything in crypto uh, besides Bitcoin. But if they have like stocks in a big way, they have gold in a big way next to Bitcoin, that's totally fine for me. At least that's, <laughs> at least they're not involved in a scam or something like that. Uh, so I, I try really hard to get all perspectives in the widest range possible on this topic of sound money, Bitcoin and freedom in this podcast. And I, I hope I do a good job. Uh, and uh, definitely uh, thank you for everyone listening, watching all my episodes. I'm, I'm still amazed when I sometimes see the watch hours that goes in a podcast. I recently released uh, uh, an episode that went really good. And in the first four hours, people watch that podcast uh, with 1,000 hours. Like 1,000 hours went in the first four hours of watch time. It's like, crazy for me um but back to the topic um before we end the podcast i always re i'm really curious about what bitcoiners are in general right now doing because i think bitcoiners are really open critical thinking uh curious uh people uh and so besides biology and bitcoin is there anything that you're currently uh studying or is there anything that you're currently really passionate about okay yeah that's a very interesting question. So, so two things come come to my mind. So, one thing is I'm uh, trying to again be more active and uh, going to the gym uh, that I previously was, uh, but then I had like a, a period of like as you do right with with uh, the PhD that um, is also a, a mental mental battle. Uh, but now I'm trying to um, go back also uh, working out. That's one thing. And the second thing it's kind of related to I would still say. Uh, Bitcoin and the topic about money, I always try to read on um, other views. Uh, that's the thing that I also uh, said previously. Uh, try to not get captured in, in one single bubble. Try to burst out of the bubble and try to read books. Also, uh, what I'm currently reading um, are books about MMT, you know, because I, I want to understand the, the viewpoint and the argumentation um, that those individuals uh, bring to the table um, to yeah to understand where they're coming from. So this is one main message that I would like also to 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 point out. Try to if you are able to and you speak more than one language, try to get information also uh, geographically from another space uh, from another place uh, space maybe maybe from aliens if you're able to. 
but you know what I mean. So pr- try to diversify the input that you get and try to always question if uh, your argumentations make sense and if another person brings up a new argument where you're like, okay, very interesting point. I did not um, take this argument into my uh, calculation. Why? Because you can only learn um, if you are able to get other worldviews in and digest those. That's that's key. Uh, I, I love that too. Uh, I'm so sorry that I have to like we we <laughs> we we having before we started recording, we had this discussion also about my podcast that I have guests all over the world. This kind of touches on that point why I'm also having a English podcast and not German podcast because we both are able to speak German really fine. Uh, and so we could do it in German too, but we decided to do it in English or I decided to do it in English uh, in the whole podcast because when I speak German, there is like a small group of people that all are living in similar conditions, I would say, uh, and are not from all over the world. In when I do it in English, all of a sudden I'm open to I speak with Indian people, with African people, with American, Australian, from all over the world with completely different uh, point of views. And someone from Africa just thinks about Bitcoin differently than someone from Germany. Uh, and uh, that's that's amazing to, f- uh, to see. And this is just uh, what I wanted to add, which is also really amazing. I have an end routine uh, that is the, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. And the end routine is just fitting so nicely into our current de- discussion, which I'm, which I'm amazed about because usually it does not fit in nicely. The question from the previous guest to you is, what was the last book you read and what is the next book you want to read? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so currently I'm, I'm going into uh, books that are written by Warren Mosler, I think is his name, and also Stephanie Kelton. So these are uh, two very big um, MMT proponents. Uh, Stephanie Kelton also recently um, released a or is releasing a movie called Finding uh, the Money or something like this. I watched this in a live live um, occasion here in in Switzerland. It was very interesting, and uh, a, um, a clip went viral from this um, from this movie. Uh, I think it was some chief economist advisor of the current or last um, government in in the US of the White House, uh, basically showing him not being able to answer the question, why do the government even borrow if it can create the money? Okay, at this, uh, maybe you saw saw the clip, it went it went viral. This I'm I'm currently um, doing. Uh, what next? Which book next? That was the other question, right? Uh, yes, exactly. Like, what what was the last book you read, and what is the the next book you will you want to read? Um, I have so many on on my list, but uh, I, I I cannot tell you one title sadly. But I will keep uh, bursting into the bubble of also um mmt and other other views to to steel steel mate steel mate steel mate the arguments um yeah really cool uh it's it's fascinating to to have so many great views uh thank you uh luca for being on thank you for uh taking your time and 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 bringing uh, us the great perspective you you have and the all all insights um before i let you go where can people find you when they have questions for you where where's the place they can find you the best way yeah no first of all i i would like you thank you very much robin for this uh hopefully engaging discussion also for the for the audience and yeah how can people find me i would say the easiest way is um, is on uh, linkedin so maybe you can also um, add this in the description and one other thing for people that um, now are new into the space or you know the price is going up uh, and uh, you want to read something that is really brief and is 19 minutes to get this deeper knowledge about not only price moving up technology. I even wrote uh, a very small uh, medium article that you can also find through my uh, LinkedIn. It's called um, From Molecules to, to Bitcoin. And I think it's a very good starter to uh, dive immediately deeper. 
to start asking the important questions. So this is how, how people can uh, find me. Thank you very much. Amazing. I will put the LinkedIn uh, link in the, in the description and then people can find you there and find uh, your Medium article. So thank you for, for being on, uh, Luca. Thanks.